Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the Debucharistic podcast, Debucharistic Revival, all about the Eucharist re Eucharistic Revival here in the Archdiocese of Dubuque. My name is Father Jacob Rouse, and I'm the pastor of Notre Dame Parish in Cresco, and uh, I'm very delighted to be joined by my brother priest, Father Kevin. Father Kevin, could you say a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am yes. Father Kevin Earlywine, co-host of the Debucharistic Revival podcast, because that's the name we're going with. Um, and, Amen. Uh, could be our subtitle, <laughs> Debucharistic. Anyways, Father Kevin, pastor of St. Patrick's uh, Catholic Church in Hampton and St. Mary's Church in Ackley. I'm happy to be here as your co-host. Excellent. Co, meaning together. Um, so today we're going to be talking about art and music. Uh, my favorite instrument to play and listen to is the trumpet. Do you have a favorite instrument to listen to or play, Father Kevin? Ah, well, I also learned trumpet back in the day, but I've also been taught, well, someone attempted to teach me how to play the spoons. Oh. You know how in like an old uh, bluegrass music, I hit the spoons together. And... Yeah, so, great. Anyways, so I've, uh, I enjoy attempting to play them. I'm not very good at it. but You haven't incorporated that into the liturgy yet? Not yet. No, not until liturgical music. No, no. Okay, so, gotcha. Still figuring out how to put it with holy God, we praise thy name, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Anyway, we are, joined to, with, uh, we are joined by two very special guests today instead of one. Um, uh, Connor Miller and Anastasia both are uh, deeply involved in liturgy and music and worship for the Archdiocese. Um, Anastasia, can you uh, share your name and where you are and a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm honored to be here. Anastasia Nicholas, and I currently minister at St. Edward Parish with Liturgy and Music in Waterloo. Um, also, I'm blessed to be the chair of the Archdiocese and Worship Commission, and so um, really just get to be steeped in the liturgy. I uh, began involvement with music at Mass. Um, I was kind of commissioned into it in fifth grade, and kind of have been at it ever since uh, from those slow, humble starts. So, um, yeah, I have ministered in various areas of the diocese and very, like youth ministry, um, campus ministry, and kind of settled in liturgical ministry. So you've seen it all. I've seen it all. More or less. <laughs> what is your favorite instrument to listen to and or play? That's a tough one for me. I played French horn in high school, but I never really played it well. I love mm -hmm. the way it sounds when it is played well. And the instrument I've always wanted to play is the violin slash fiddle. Mm -hmm. I just think it adds so much to any sort of music, both liturgical and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, the French horn is a very noble instrument, no matter how you play it. So that's good. And the, well, fiddle, think... the fiddle pairs well with spoons, I just want to say. Uh -huh. Right, right. <laughs> We could have a band after this. Mm. Our next guest is um, Connor Miller. Um, can you say a little bit about yourself and where you're working? Sure. Uh, yeah. You're uh, my name is Connor Miller, and I currently serve as the director of music at St. Patrick Catholic Church in Cedar Rapids. And I also work part time as an administrative assistant in the Office of Worship for the Archdiocese of Dubuque. Um, I was born and raised here in Cedar Rapids uh, and started doing music in middle school and started playing specifically for the liturgy uh, piano uh, in middle school. Kind of continued that throughout high school. I uh, graduated in 2017 from Xavier uh, in Cedar Rapids. Um, and after high school, I was ready to just make it more of a hobby. Uh, so I went to college for degrees in graphic design and theology. Um, and about a week into that, I uh, was informed that there's a pastoral music ministry degree that I should have considered. Um, and after a moment in Eucharistic adoration and some consolation uh, from the Holy Spirit, uh, I decided to kind of change that path um, and ended up here back home uh, in good old CR. Mm. That's that's great. Um, and we're from the um, same parish growing up in the same uh high school and uh our parents are friends and uh, so that's pretty cool absolutely and connection. you are one heck of a uh, trumpet instructor instructor uh yeah oh well thank taught you. me once upon a time <laughs> yes yeah uh what is your favorite instrument connor to listen to um, and or play uh to play uh pipe organ um i just think it, it's such a beautiful instrument 
um, in the wide range of things you can do with it, from the quietest string section to the brassiest brass se- uh, brass section. Um, so, yeah, um, that's a fun one to play to listen to a uh, cello, um, and I'd love to learn that someday. Mm. Uh, a nice solid string instrument. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very good. Well, the organ is objectively the king of all the instruments. Yeah. So, great choice. Is it? <laughs> um, so we've, we've done some introduction, but um, as we're going to be talking about music and art, um, I'd like to, uh, Anastasia, can you go either like over the span of your life or even just pick one pretty meaningful moment? What is music meant to you? And um, what are ways or experiences where music has been help- helpful in your life or spiritual life or personal life? Yeah, I think that music's kind of been a thread um, throughout my life just to um, connect me to other people, actually. So I found that like in college, I was in college when alternative music was just becoming a thing. And so it kind of helped me learn new um, avenues of music with friendships. Um, And just in different times of loss, I found that song really can maybe express things that I couldn't express with just words, but music helps with that. Um, And so I just think it's so interesting how, um, as I think about that, like that's been true with secular music. And then as I've become more and more involved with the church, just to see families at times like funerals or weddings and just how the music really does touch a deeper chord. You know, God gave us that just to be able to really connect in a higher realm, I think. That's beautiful. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Same question. (laughs) No, I absolutely agree. And that was like the same line of thinking I had, like it offers so much more than just what spoken word can. Um, I was reminded of, or constantly reminded of, a Hans Christian Andersen quote, where words fail, music speaks. Um, and as I was kind of reflecting and preparing for today, that came back up. Um, and it, yeah, it just, it elevates it. Um, our thoughts, our prayers. Um, and I know, yeah, I found that especially impactful and meaningful. I think of some of the conferences I've attended, uh, whether that be a Steubenville conference or a Sikh conference, uh, when you're in adoration and just struggling to find the words to express what it means to be there in the presence of the Lord in this intimate moment. Um, sometimes, yeah, those words just fill that void so well. Um, I, and then uh, specifically uh, 2019 uh, at the Sikh conference in Indianapolis, um, they had been using uh, antiphons for the day and um, the text the church had given for that day was, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth for communion. So just sitting there after having received our Lord um, and exclaiming that, uh, just a powerful moment that sticks out to me specifically uh, relating to liturgical music and how it um, lends itself to prayer and elevating it. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, so that uh, that's really beautiful, and uh, yeah, so that actually is a nice transition into our next question. Unless you were going to say something, Father Jacob. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, of just how so. Yeah, so music is uh, can service touch us in in deeper ways, help us to express deeper things than than we know how to say. I like that that music. Uh, what is it with where words fail, music speaks, and how that works in our personal lives and prayer lives and everything. But you kind of set us up there, Connor, to. To, so specifically, so music can can help in many ways, but kind of more specifically, how is it? How does music serve uh, more specifically the lit, the liturgy? And since this is a Eucharistic revival podcast, kind of leaning towards specifically kind of the Eucharistic mystery. And so, whoever wants to field that question first, <laughs> you can say it. <laughs> can't point at can't point at each other. <laughs> All right, yeah, we both pointed at each other. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just think you know, it's such a big question. So um, I just think when it comes to the Eucharistic mystery, um, what I think music helps with is 
um, the act of us all singing together really calls us to recognize that, especially as Catholics, it's never just me and Jesus. While that relationship is important, um, my relationship with Jesus matters you know, amazingly. Um, at the same time, it's never just me and Jesus. It's all of us together. And so all of us raising our voices together um, in a liturgy and particularly at mass, I just think really speaks to just the beauty that God can create. And especially, I mean, I think there's people who will say like, well, but I don't have a voice like you just sing. And like, God doesn't care. You know, I just think particularly um, one of my uh, favorite moments in mass is um, the preface before the holy holy um, and as musicians we're always prepared to hear words such as and with all the angels and saints we you know we lift up our voices and song or you know something more eloquent than that at mass but um it's like our cue and it's also the truth you know like we really are the angels and saints are there worshiping at heaven and we get to join them as we sing that song and it's just like you know if you really think about the impact of that like how amazing and then when we sing the amen the highest point of the whole liturgy just really yeah we believe that it's the truth so anyway that's just a few thoughts that come to mind right away beautiful yeah, singing with the angels and saints being swept up in the heavenly song. Yeah, yeah, it's just amazing to me. Sorry, I'm coming in again, but um, so I um have had some significant losses in my life, including my husband and my mother, and I just think um, like I don't even ever feel alone, you know, because I. I'm at mass often and I pray that they're among those saints that I'm um, praying with and singing with at that moment. And so just, I think music connects us beyond this world. It's just amazing. Like, mm -hmm. praise God. Yeah. I just, uh, to add to that, the, that reminds me when you're talking. Um, so there, there's a scene I love. So I'm kind of a, a book nerd and I love Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> But in his book, The Cimmerillion, which is kind of his history book of Middle Earth uh, fiction, of course, but he himself being a devout, Catholic, de de devout Catholic, has, there's a lot of beautiful, deep spiritual truths. And he depicts the creation of, of his fantasy world with sort of the, the God, the creator God figure, um, singing the world into being. And so then as all the other kind of spiritual beings are created, all the other gods, they like are all singing in harmony in the unfolding of this creation. And I just think that's really beautiful. So it was like how all of creation kind of as it unfolds is sort of being taken up uh, into, into kind of this, this, this song uh, of kind of this cosmic song together and everything. And that's, that's exactly what we're participating in, uh, in that. So that's what yeah, I would have thought exactly. when you were saying there. Um, oh, I want to add the dark side of that, Father Kevin. Oh, Melkor. yes, please do. Yes. Melkor is in there and he thinks he's the most beautiful and he sings song. He sings his song the loudest and doesn't match with everyone else and then sows discord in the land. Mm -hmm. He's the Satan figure. So you can read into that what you will. But anyway, we all are joining together in, in song. And, oh, but and, to finish, we're going to finish that thought. <laughs> No, What's go ahead. beautiful about that is then it, he uses that as a beautiful explanation of why God allows evil. Because then uh, um, the the Melkor, the Satan figure, he sings dissonance into the creative song. Uh, but then he talks about how the, the creator God in his providence then weaves it into his great symphony uh, of, you know, using using the discord and dissonances to resolve into beautiful harmonies and everything. So, like, it's exactly how he then he uh, to the frustration of evil weaves it into his even greater plan, which I think is such a beautiful example of, of how God, uh, you know, how, why, you know, there's the great question, why does God allow evil? And we could talk for an hour about that, but we'd get, we are, of course, of our central subject, but I think it just beautifully demonstrates um, kind of like, I think it's such a beautiful image of like how, even when there is evil and discord, um, like how God can weave it into, when we give it over to him, he can weave it into something greater. Um, you know, that doesn't mean he wants and desires evil for us, but that, his providence is such that kind of the old expression, God can draw straight with crooked lines. So, or how he can take something as horrific as a crucifixion and use that to be then the source of all our peace, the source of love, the source of reconciliation and our salvation. So, um, and new life and yeah. new life, right? Yeah. He can take this torturous thing of death. That's awful and evil and agonizing and brings new life, divine life. And um, yeah, exactly. 
And to Anastasia's previous point, um, not that the Satan figure and Melkor sowing discord and dissension is the person in the congregation who cannot sing. But <laughs> what I'm saying Thank you for is clarifying that, that. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. The person who uh, just lets it loose, even though they can't sing, like mm-hmm. that's you're part of the community and you're part of the congregation. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, we all have a part to play. So. Um, Connor's chomping at the bit to answer that question uh, that we, we got off track due to Tolkien, which mm-hmm. could be another episode. As he does. Anyway. Um, um, <laughs> but yeah, I agree like 100%, like this idea of community. And that's something I always highlight when talking about uh, the liturgy, specifically this moment with the, the Sanctus, the Holy Holy, um, and that call to join all of the angels and the saints. Um I think it's easy to just kind of have that go in one ear and out the other. But like, that's a huge moment where we're reminded what we're celebrating in this hour here on earth is happening for eternity. And we're just getting this glimpse of it, even though it may may be veiled. Um, Another thing I I mentioned frequently about that um, is there was a study done, I believe in Great Britain, uh, with people who sing together and make music together. And it found that um, when they make music together, their heartbeats will align. It's like in this moment, our heartbeats wow. align with heavens. And I just think that's like super poignant uh, when it comes to the Eucharistic celebration mm-hmm. and the wedding feast of the Lamb. I need to go lay down and think about that for a while. Wow, that just gave me chills. That's amazing. Um, wow. Um, well, along heartbeats, I, I might just add to that. So I, I do talk about how part of the spiritual life is sort of a divine heart transplant, right? So like it's our heart being transformed into being being filled with the heart of Jesus Christ, the sacred heart, um, and how in a very uh, poignant way, like how that comes to us in the Eucharist, like there's some beautiful um connections between the eucharist and like the heart of jesus christ like we believe it is his real presence body blood soul and divinity but then there's some really neat things with eucharistic miracles how um that at that at times the host has manifested living flesh and blood and how um like how that has often been uh and they've done scientific studies that that's and it's like living heart tissue so like in this really real way of like how it just and music it, aligning our hearts with the Lord, so like it's preparing us to in an even deeper way in reception of the Eucharist to for our hearts to beat with His. So, yeah, yeah, that just makes me think too. Like, oh, I think those miracles are so um, miraculous, of course, and like just amazing <laughs> beyond belief. But then also how um, His heart then is beating like upon reception of the Lord, we're called, you know, we've become one with him. So it's like music. It's like the actual physical reception. And then the idea that we're meant to continue this song as we leave, you know, as Mm. we go forth. So it's just kind of a beautiful way to think about, I'm thinking about it with like the example you gave from Tolkien and how, um, you know, maybe the creator began the world with song and then just how song could really be a unit of force beyond mm-hmm. the walls of creation. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I have a two pronged question. Um, only the Blessed Virgin assumed. Um, and so I don't want to assume that our listeners, n- well, some might, but um, <laughs> the de- the definition of liturgy is. <laughs> Self, whether you want to go with the Greek or or um, what it means to us right now in these contemporary times, but what is li- what is liturgy and what does it mean to you? And then the second part is that probably means some things. Then we're tapping into emotion, but if there's a liturgy, that probably means do we just let our emotions go wild and we sing and dance and do whatever and play whatever song? I'm not sure. So can um, can one of you uh, jump on that real quick? <laughs> I'll try. Um, Yeah. So liturgy, um, you know, means the work of the people. And I like to add for the glory of God, because it's not just about um, the work of the people. It's not about us only. We matter, but it's really to glorify God. And so I think um, knowing that it comes from that just speaks a lot to what we're about. And I think one of the beauties of our Catholic faith is that we're given what are called... um, 
rubrics or guidelines by which to um, do that, because if we're going to be universal, which is what Catholic means, we can't just make it all up. And again, it's I think it's easy to make it all about us if we're just making like, oh, I like this reading. I like this song, you know, so I know I work with children a lot and um, sometimes they'll like say if they They'll be pretty clear about if they like a song or not, right? <laughs> and uh, I'll just remind them, like, I don't necessarily like every song I choose, but it's the right song because it matches the maybe the readings of the day, the theme of the day, and um, can still draw us deeper into the um, mystery of God. So I think those are some of the things I think about when making choices, Um because, yeah, there's a lot of options, but, um, you know, I'm not going to necessarily sing the song I listen to on the top 40. I won't be singing the song. I won't be singing necessarily. I won't be singing that song <laughs> in the liturgy because it just wasn't created with the um, idea of a ritual dimension mm-hmm. as part of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so no, no Beyonce during Mass. Huh? <laughs> not during Mass. <laughs> we used to joke when I uh, was working at a and campus ministry though that we would have like a prince um <laughs> yeah it's not gonna happen but based on purple I, rain. I was just, I was so, just like so, purple rain down ahead. or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got something yeah. There. we'll add in kevin's spoons and then it'll be great that's mm-hmm. right yeah yeah we used to i just uh i remember at loris college there was a hymnal called that was titled journey songs that i would see in the mm-hmm. sacristy and i always thought it was funny because i i then jokingly would say, you know, how we should have like a journey mass. So st- yeah. all, all themed around or stylized after the band journey, you know, like don't yeah. stop believing in any way you want it. Uh, but anyways, With open so, arms. Yes. <laughs> so that's enough of that. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Connor, what, what, is, uh, what does liturgy mean to you? And um, yeah, I guess. What does um, that mean? Yeah. Like Anastasia said, it's, it's, the work of the people for the glory of God. And I think that's very important. Um, uh, The glory of God. And also like, it's our opportunity with this act of public worship. Liturgy is public worship in the church um, to help kind of transform our hearts. And uh, talking about what we were later or earlier, earlier in the podcast, Um, but yeah, transforming our hearts uh, in this moment of public worship um, in the liturgy, um, and the, the fact that the church does give us rubrics and words to pray with, um, to conform our hearts to Christ's. Um, and I think there's also a beautiful space, like the, the Catholic faith is a both and faith. So there's also like the devotional aspect where like, if there is a specific song you can pray with that might not fit in the liturgy, like there's still space for that. Uh, maybe not in the public worship, but in private devotional worship. And I think, um, yeah, it's important to have both of those um, in in the life of faith of a Christian um, and not to forget one or the other. The, the liturgy, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. There's a two-way thing there. So everything we do in the liturgy should impact how we pray devotionally, and how we pray devotionally should impact how we experience the liturgy. Um, and there's a two-way street there. Mm-hmm. I love that, Connor. I think that um, I'm so glad that you mentioned that public aspect of it and um, and how that really mer- melds together. Because I think sometimes people get the misconception that somehow the church is saying that certain music isn't worthy or good because it isn't sung within the walls of the church. And I don't think that that's what we're saying. Like there's lots of music that's wonderful for personal devotion. As you say, it just, again, doesn't um, meet the standard of really being intended for public worship and that ritual dimension. Yeah. Yeah, I think we would say in liturgy, like music is is doing a specific servicing in a, a, a particular action, right? And and which is the service of these particular texts and prayers and and what is happening here, right? Like so, offertory where we're offering our lives up to the Lord, communion where we're entering into this Eucharistic mystery. So, um, so, so the music should be a reflection of how is it we're praying corporately. So, 
and when I give a talk on prayer, I talk uh, when I've given talks to my people on prayer, I talk about that very thing that we, we both our prayer lives should have both our, our private personal prayer, right? <laughs> Devotional prayers, we might call it. But then there's also this dimension of a public liturgical prayer and you need both, right? Because if you just go to mass, but never have a personal prayer life, like it can become easily just to seem like empty ritual or vice versa. If I just have my own personal prayer life, but I never go to church, um, then I, then it's really tempting to make it just about me. And uh, I think part of the beautiful thing uh, as, and you guys, guys kind of alluded to this already is part of liturgy and of the Eucharistic mystery, therefore, and thus the music in it is, is not just about what I like, but it's, it's, this thing is transforming me. Like I go to liturgy to be shaped and formed by it. Um, so it's not about tailoring it uh, like disc jockey, just making the playlist that I like for this particular thing. But it's about um, I'm going and then these rituals, these prayers, these words, and the music is at service of that, of me being transformed by the mystery that we're encountering. I'm really glad you brought up what I like because I know there are certain songs that Father Jacob really, really likes, and there are certain songs that Father Jacob does not like, and some of them are uh, melodic taste, uh, some of them are theology, and some of them are just, I hate that because I'm, I don't know, immature and don't want to reflect. Um, so I think the fact that there's, um, and I actually do, I love the rubrics, I love pouring through and learning, it seems like I learn something every time, uh, When oh wait, we're supposed to be doing that, not supposed to be doing that, mm -hmm. I don't see it as a, a like really strict rule following, I see it as this is the guidelines for how we have a universal liturgy. So whether it's a daily mass or whether it's the Easter vigil, uh, those, those, uh, those texts in there are really helpful. So yeah, it's not about, this isn't about personal preference. This is about my preference for the whole, I think. Yeah. Uh, I like how you said to father Kevin that it forms us. And I know that's something that as a person who, um, is choosing the music that the people of God will sing. I really think about that aspect of it a lot. Like these, the music that we're choosing is going, the words we sing are going to form us. So like mm -hmm. just making sure that those words are worthy. It makes me kind of think of a quote that there's a document of the um, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops sing to the Lord music and divine worship. That's a kind of a guideline to what to choose. And I always love the introductions of these documents because there's just so much beauty in them. And it speaks um, a cry from deep within our being. Music is a way for God to lead us to the realm of higher things. Mm. And um, yeah, and so choices should do that and not just mm. be about if I like it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. Wow. I think we covered good things. <laughs> that was a great conversation. Very so, good. Bef well, before we, before we wrap up and everything, uh, feel free to share any more thoughts you have about music and liturgy, but kind of to make it more connecting more explicitly to Eucharistic revival, as you know, where the reason we're doing this podcast is because we're in this season of when the bishops have called in the United States for Eucharistic revival. Uh, and so in, this is a, trying to be at service of that, particularly in the Archdiocese of Dubuque. So just some thoughts on that and feel free, again, since we're talking about music and beauty and uh, how it fits away with that. But basically, Eucharistic Revival, why does it matter? And what would you want to be like one takeaway for our listeners to be as we kind of journey on this, uh, I mean, day in general, but uh, with kind of an eye towards Eucharistic Revival? Uh, yeah, I think, oh, <laughs> I was voluntold. Uh, no, um, I think uh, in this time of <laughs> Eucharistic revival, like it's such a beautiful point in everyone's faith life to like re-examine what our relationship with the Eucharist is. Um, a good reminder, I think it's easy to fall into a, I take this for granted kind of camp and just go through the motions. Mm -hmm. um, so in this time specifically to take a step back and re-examine like Eucharistic devotion um, and what that looks like for each person. Um, and then like one tangible to take away, I think, um, like be diligent about praying in the liturgy and noticing those words and phrases like singing with all the angels and the saints or other things throughout the Eucharistic prayer, um, that help remind us that we are 
participating in something eternal uh, and beyond what we're just in here and now. Um, I think that can be huge for developing that Eucharistic devotion as well. Yeah, I would agree with that, too. Um, I think that really that call to um, pray, I mean, music, like we're called to sing the liturgy, right? So music isn't just something that's added on, and liturgy isn't just a thing we could choose to do. You know, like this is, um, uh, we're singing the liturgy. It's like actually part of the prayer, an important part of it. So I would encourage people to really um just as Connor just said, to really be praying, um, just really put your heart into it, right? We put our heart into so many other um, aspects of our life. Um, and how much more do you get out of something if you're putting your heart into it? And really, I think this Eucharistic revival is calling me and I think us to um, a deeper relationship with Jesus in the Eucharist. And that means Jesus himself and Jesus in my brother and sister. So I just think that it really is calling us to um, a deeper relationship in a time when I think we all could agree there's been um, some ruptures and division um, in the world and in the church. I think this is really a call to um, allow the Holy Spirit um, to draw us deeper into the life of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Being forged into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, speaking of Eucharistic revival, uh, I want to give a shout out also to Connor Miller, who's here with, with us. But some of you may or may not know, but we are joined with us today. We have a quasi-local uh, celebrity in our midst. So uh, on the National Eucharistic Revival uh, movement, sort of their, their website and everything, and leading towards a big National Eucharistic Conference that will be happening in June, I think, of 2024. Um, but along the way, as part of that, they're having some different art pieces of different um, Eucharistic saints, I believe. That's Is that correct? Like oh. saints who... Uh, kind of is it uh, saints, witnesses. Right? They're not all or, saints or, yet. Or, witnesses. Okay, so yeah, witnesses, so venerables, uh, beatifies, and some saints, but but figures uh, who have who have been a great Eucharistic witness through their devotion to the Eucharist, through the way they live their lives with flowing to or from the Eucharistic mystery, or the way they inspire devotion to the Eucharist and others, uh, which is really really cool. But what's especially really cool about that is. Um, is the person uh, that's making the art pieces is in our midst right now. A.K.A. Connor Miller is making some artistic pieces. So, oh. Connor, tell us a little bit about that, uh, uh, please, about the, 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 art, the art that you're doing for the Eucharistic Revival along those lines. Sure. Say more. Uh, so, yeah, um, in my free time, outside of doing music at the church, uh, for the church and for the glory of God, I also do graphic design uh, and artwork. Um, also for the glory of God. Um, and uh, through this, um, was invited to help participate uh, in creating art for the National Eucharistic Revival. Uh, so this started back in July, um, each month leading up to the Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis. Uh, they are highlighting an American Eucharistic witness. So as you said, someone who uh, exemplified what it means to live a Eucharistic life. Uh, we have everyone from uh, Cardinal Francis George. He was the first one. Uh, Father Augustus Tolton, uh, who is well on his way to sainthood. Um, I just wrapped up mm -hmm. sketches for next month's uh, Charlene Richard. Uh, she's a young uh, girl out of Louisiana. Um, so people from all walks of life, um, who have really exemplified what it means to live a Eucharistic life. Uh, and with each of those, they are having someone write an essay about how this person exemplified that Eucharistic life. Um, and with the essay, um, I'm doing a woodcut print of each of them uh, mm -hmm. to kind of creatively depict and call to mind who this person was. Um, so I'm incredibly honored and blessed that, um, I'm able to contribute in that way. Um, and it, it's been really neat to learn all of these stories and be, be able to bring these people to life, uh, through a unique medium, uh, in woodcut printmaking. 
Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that's really cool. Um, to to go from in our conversation about um, uh, what is it? Audio music. I mean the the music of sound or art of sound and music and then go to a visual medium as well so mm-hmm. you're multi-express expressive um mm-hmm. is there like a, a website or a catalog or anything that that we could see absolutely some of your so all of these uh with the essays are being featured on the eucharistic revival website so uh eucharistic slash blog um i think the most recent one you'll see in there uh is dorothy day um, and then it's also a great mm-hmm. resource. Uh, they have a good breakdown explaining the parts of the mass and a number of other things that are just useful in developing our Eucharistic devotions um, and relationship with the Eucharist. So you can check it out there. Other artwork of mine, you can find at www.connormiller.design. Um, and that features all of that artwork, plus some other religious artwork that I have been up to, uh, in the past. That's excellent. I will definitely put those two websites in the, uh, show notes and description yeah. of this episode. Yeah, I was going to ask if there were show notes. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. They're will, so yeah. awesome. That's also, cool. are, can we feature those at our, in our local Dubuque, uh, Eucharistic Revival website? Um, our choice is Dubuque slash Eucharistic Revival that Connor conveniently also manages and posts. Yeah, I might on, know a so. guy. <laughs> Okay, great. So is there a way you can put that art and maybe those blog pieces too on uh, directly on our Dubuque website yes. uh, as well? Yep. So, which is a nice segue into a reminder to our listeners for things going on specifically in the Archdiocese of Dubuque, visit dbqarch.org slash archdiocesan dash eucharistic dash revival uh, and, or just Google Archdiocese of Dubuque Eucharistic Revival and you will find it. It is our page that we try to stay updated with different events going on um, throughout the Archdiocese of Eucharistic Revival events uh a big thing coming up uh our local speaker anthony digman has been traveling around and giving different talks in eucharist revival so um so you can check that out about where he'll be in in upcoming things as well as there has been a traveling eucharistic miracles display that has been at various parishes uh throughout the archdiocese uh, and also of course be remember to check your local parish or surrounding parishes for different eucharistic revivaly things I know there's been a number of Eucharistic revival studies going on at some parishes as and various other talks as well. So lots of exciting things coming up, and you can check all that out on our websites uh, on the local level and also on the national level. Um, so there you go. Well, this has been a, a truly anointed and uh, fascinating conversation, um, and I know we could go on for a lot a lot longer too, but uh, maybe we'll have a part two. Um, one final thing I'd like to share um Anastasia and I crossed paths at uh, UNI, and um, mm-hmm. I can't remember if a saint, I read this in a saint writing somewhere, or if Anastasia taught me, um, or maybe a little bit of both, but um, I learned that uh, we we are all stained glass windows. Mm. And, Thomas um, Merton, yep. Oh, thanks. Okay, I was going to attribute it to you, but we'll, we'll, give, it to Tom, yeah. we'll give Tommy the credit, but basically <laughs> we're all stained glass windows. If you're looking uh, through transparent window pane sure the light is all pouring in but then our um individuality uh our spirituality our thumbprints everything that makes us us sin included because the stain um idea too but that that's what lets the the light flow in and and just and just make beautiful visual art in the church so um i i teach that quite regularly and i attribute it to you anastasia but now i'll give Thomas Merton the credit as well. So I think that's we give it me. to Anastasia. So <laughs> <laughs> beg, borrow, steal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, well, thank you, everyone, um, and listeners too. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this has been this isn't a fun ongoing journey as we uh, travel and play and adventure all up the mountain to the source and summit that is the Eucharist. So Amen. I'll see everyone this weekend. See you in the Eucharist.